people in groups can be very different from people who are just individuals left to their own devices. In this set of PowerPoint slides, we're going to talk about some of the ways in which groups uh, affect the behavior of individuals. Uh, we're specifically going to talk about the phenomenon of social facilitation, social loafing, social compensation, and de-individuation. Let's talk first about social facilitation. Social facilitation is the phenomenon where when people are engaged in some sort of behavior, they engage in it more vigorously and with more energy when there are other people around than when they're by themselves. So for example, uh, joggers walking around, uh, jogging around a track actually run a little faster if there are other people running with them or if there are just spectators sitting around watching them. The presence of other people uh, makes the individual uh, perform the action with more vigor. This is one of the oldest uh, known social psychological uh, findings. Uh, the first recorded uh, investigation of social facilitation was done in 1897 by a researcher named Triplett. 1897 is virtually prehistoric for social psychology. Uh, but Triplett was doing some studies on motor behavior, and he had people uh, winding fishing reels and pedaling exercise bicycles, and he was actually interested in how people perform physical activities. But uh, by accident in his studies, he noticed that when people were winding fishing reels or pedaling exercise bicycles, they did it more quickly when there were other people around them who were also engaged in the same behavior. And um, human beings are not the only ones who show social facilitations. For example, cockroaches run faster when there are other cockroaches around them running. Uh, chickens and rats eat more quickly if there are other chickens and rats around them eating as well. So social facilitation is a very noticeable thing that happens uh, when people are in groups. There are a number of different explanations for why social facilitation might occur. The first one I'll discuss is uh, something called drive theory, or sometimes it's simply known as the effects of uh, mere presence. According to this perspective, the presence of other people increases your arousal levels. Just having other people around um, is more arousing than being by yourself. And these heightened arousal levels enhance the performance of whatever your most dominant behaviors are. In other words, the things that you do that are habits um, get done more quickly and vigorously uh, in the presence of other people when your arousal levels are higher. Now it's called social facilitation because if the response that you're making is the correct one, your um, behavior will actually be more effective. Uh, your performance level will be better. On the other hand, if you've learned some bad habits and the most dominant response that comes out when your arousal levels go up, goes up isn't the correct one, uh, your performance will actually suffer a bit. And in that case, it's called social inhibition rather than social facilitation. But we're going to focus on the social facilitation part. So one explanation for this is simply that having other people around raises arousal levels, and this enhances uh, the performance of well-learned responses. Another perspective is something known as evaluation apprehension. According to this point of view, it isn't just the mere presence of other people that cause social facilitation, but it's our concern over being evaluated by them that raises our arousal levels. So it isn't just that people are there, but they're there and perhaps they're making judgments about you. And they've done some really wacky experiments to test this. They have people uh, performing a task uh, in front of other people, but sometimes these other people are blindfolded and can't see what they're doing, but they're still there. And the evidence is kind of inconclusive. Uh, sometimes the presence of other people uh, only results in social facilitation if they're evaluating you, but sometimes that isn't the case. It happens anyway. Uh, now, of course, if somebody's evaluating you, um, this could add to their mere presence. We'll come back to that in a moment. But evaluation apprehension is another possibility. Although it would be hard to explain the behavior of cockroaches and chickens if evaluation apprehension is the thing that's going on in social facilitation. The 
perspective that's probably most popular right now is something called the distraction conflict model. Um, our arousal goes up because there's a conflict between paying attention to the task at hand and paying attention to other people. And so it's this conflict, not the mere presence of the other people, that uh, raises our arousal levels and causes social facilitation. And evaluation and apprehension can get thrown in here because other people might be more distracting when they're evaluating us. And there are studies that distract people with other things like flashing lights or buzzers and they find that this kind of distraction can also result in what looks like social facilitation. So there's some evidence for this. One last way of thinking about it is uh, by social comparison. Uh, we look at the behavior of other people and we be get competitive with them and we adjust our behavior to match theirs. And so that's another possible explanation. I'm not really going to take sides on which of these is most correct. I think they may all play a role, but I do want you to be aware that there are different possible explanations for why social facilitation occurs. So let's talk a little bit about something called social loafing. Social loafing is what happens when a group is engaged in a task and as the size of the group gets bigger, each person experiences less pressure to work hard. Think of any times you may have been helping somebody move a heavy object. If there's only you and one or two other people lifting and carrying this very heavy thing, you really put a lot of effort into it. On the other hand, if there's a great big crowd of people all lifting this thing, there's less pressure on you and less dependence on you for the task to be successful, so you tend to slack off a little bit. That's what social loafing is all about. There's the tendency to not work as hard when other people are present. And there have been a lot of studies uh, that show that this is the case. Uh, there have been laboratory studies where people are pulling on ropes and they think other people are also pulling on the ropes and they're monitoring the uh, amount of power that the group is exerting. Well, uh, people pull with less strength on their rope if they think lots of other people are pulling as well. If they think they're the only one doing it, they pull harder. Similarly, uh, in studies where they think they're involved in uh, studies of spectator behavior at sporting events, when they're clapping and screaming and cheering, they do it less as the size of the group increases. Now social loafing, loafing decreases if people think that their efforts can be monitored. So it's pretty, if it's pretty easy for other people to see how hard you're working, you're less likely to loaf. 
you're also less likely to loaf when the task is challenging, appealing, or involving in some way. So if it's something you like to do, you won't loaf on it as much as if it's something you don't like to do. Social loafing is less likely to occur when you're working with friends or cohesive teams than if you're with a bunch of strangers. Turns out social loafers are not always aware that they're loafing. Uh, when you ask people about the amount of effort they've put into something, they aren't really aware that they're putting in less when there's a group there than when they're by themselves. Social loafing and social facilitation sound very similar, and it would be easy to um, confuse the two. But keep in mind that uh, social facilitation occurs when your performance increases because of the presence of other people. Social loafing is what occurs when your effort and performance decreases because of the presence of other people. There's also a related concept known as social compensation. If the quality of the group work is important to you and you know about social loafing, you may actually work harder when other people are present than you would otherwise because you think that they're going to be engaging in social loafing. If you're doing that, it's known as social compensation. Another thing that happens to people in groups is something known as de-individuation. You become less aware of yourself as an individual and you sort of get lost and feel anonymous in the presence of the group. During de-individuation, um, individuals are prevented by the surroundings, the situation, the number of other people. They're prevented from focusing on attention inward. And so we become less self-aware of our own behavior and our own self, and we become uninhibited and will engage in activities that we ordinarily wouldn't engage in. Think of the looting that goes on during riots in the streets. You've got people smashing store windows and going in and stealing stuff. Most of these are individuals that would never engage in this kind of behavior on their own in their day-to-day -day life. But there's something about being in the presence of this large group of people who are all engaged in that behavior that frees us from doing that. It makes us feel uh, less inhibited, less identifiable, and this is the thing that not only underlies looting, but a lot of the vandalism that you'll see following sporting events or Halloween uh, festivals, especially when people are in costume. So you get a lot of weird crowd behavior. Uh, people will do a lot of stupid things uh, when they're in a group that they would never do on their own. I'll uh, let you think about your own lives and whether you can remember any instances where you engaged in some kind of uh, ridiculous or unusual behavior because you were in a group of people who were doing the same thing. There have been laboratory studies of de-individuation that show when you make people feel more anonymous, uh, you disguise their identity, for example, and put them in a group of other individuals whose identity has also been disguised, that people are more willing to engage in um, antisocial behaviors like giving electric shocks to other individuals. So de-individuation is something that uh, frequently results in uh, what we negative behaviors that we would rather not see.